everybody understand the question you're asking, I think, about ecosystem services and the importance of uh, accounting for those assets. Is that that's what you're asking them? Yeah, and even in, in, within like the, the budgets of, of their yeah. municipalities. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think, I think it's real important. We take for granted uh, the values uh, of the land. We might appreciate beauty. We might appreciate you know big, beautiful trees. But not many people take it down to the level of understanding you know, the, the, the soil organic carbon on the landscape and the fact that every acre, uh, if there's a 1% increase in organic carbon, it'll hold about 12,000 to 60,000 gallons of additional water in the soil, not in a depression on the soil, but in the soil. Nobody thinks that way. Uh, scientists are just learning about that. We're part of the team measuring that now. Uh, people don't even think about the intersection. You know, what does a, a, a tree canopy uh, do to diffuse the impact of rainfall? Uh, where I come from, where we have prairie systems, a one inch rainfall can be completely intercepted by prairie grass with no measurable increase in soil moisture. Interception is real. It's not in any engineering models. It's never accounted for. So I think, I think what's happening now is that there's this wonderful awareness uh, trying to find its way onto, onto balance sheets. Uh, ecosystem services, you know, the, the sequestration rates of plants and the value of photosynthesis for improving uh, soil carbon. That's not on any balance sheet, to my knowledge, on the planet right now. I guarantee in probably two or three years it will be on balance sheets because we're realizing that organic carbon, remember that stinginess thing I talked about? It's the organic carbon and soil colloids, like clay colloids, that are really what supports that stinginess. So I think ecosystem services are really, really, a, it's a valuable way to think and it's a valuable way for for a, people with an accounting mindset, whether it be a policymaker or a city council member, it's a really valuable concept. It's incredibly valuable to understand what you're losing or what you've lost and to figure out how to reinvest in bringing some of those values or assets back is, is just critical. First step in thinking about how to reassemble the pieces, if that makes sense. I'll just add from my experience in Vancouver, one of the challenges around ecosystem services is the land values that we're dealing with. So if a single family lot is worth 1.5 to $5 million, depending on what part of the city you're in, the tree cover, the soil volumes, the kind of carbon storage and things like that, it's going to be a challenge to use against those kind of land values. So we're kind of, we basically boxed ourselves in to, to, to use that argument in a sort of an accounting uh, basis. I mean, we don't, I think it's a supporting piece for sure, it just seems like we can't rely on it in but, but a counter to that is when you look at the, either at the landscape scale impacts of the changes that are occurring and then you amortize that over the individual lots, if, if there's a billion dollars of damage from a storm event, uh, from a flood event, um, there's no way communities can sustain that sort of impact regularly, regardless of what your values are in your lots. You know, the insurance premiums and the pricing completely changes. So I'd say the systems thinking approach changes the way one does the accounting and does the allocation of, of how you apply the ecosystem services to landscapes and to lots. Still all very early in kind of developmental uh, thinking stages. So a lot of room for uh, people to think and, and contribute to this thinking. Another question, sure. Um, forgive me, I don't understand stinginess. Could you maybe use a Vancouver example? I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't understand it. How about if I use a universal example? Two little kids fighting over a toy. Uh, that's how the idea of the word came to me. I was like, two of my cousins fighting over a toy and the the mother said, oh, he, that, that child never shares anything. Every toy, hope this makes sense, 
every toy that the other child gets for a minute is pulled right back by the first kid. Maybe that doesn't relate at all, but <laughs> it, the word stinginess is, it, to me, really helped me with, with defining the term for purposes of hydrology. All, all it basically means with regard to ecosystems is that the plant and animal communities, the soil microbes, the life on the land really is, is not freely uh, releasing nutrients and water. It's hanging on to it. And it's the whole, the whole evolutionary design of these plant and animal communities above ground and below ground is to hang on to these materials. So three years after the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980s, we studied the Toodle River and studied the, you know, what had come off of the, the watershed and the, the pre-eruption uh, discharge levels in the Toodle River were back to what they were uh, three years after the eruption. So the other thing about ecosystems is they, the, the resilience of ecosystems is, is focused on an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary behavior and response to become stingy, to really regain whatever it is, you know, the diversity, the productivity, uh, that creates that resilience. I hope that helps. The child example may have confused me. <laughs> a question over here. Um, what we'd really like to thank you for this for our development to decrease and for some of our high rises instead of the environment to become parks. We'd love that. It doesn't look like that's happening. So um, you did mention for permeability. So we're, we're looking for permeability, right, of soil. Presumably, old growth forest is probably the most permeable. Um, and a paved area is the least permeable. So the water will just run right into the local rivers. So you mentioned a parking lot being um, a porous kind of material. So what should we be telling our developers to increase permeability and water retention? I would say that I would encourage them to think holistically about the whole site and what the plan is going to be for the whole site as a system as opposed to just throwing in kind of specific tools. So we know that in our urban area we're not going to have no hardscape. So there's going to be hardscape. So what makes the most sense? Do we want to have that water flowing off of that hardscape clean? and then using that water for some other purpose, like actually capturing it, using it for some other part of our system, do we want it infiltrating locally? I know that that's a huge opportunity, but I would say rather than sort of giving a prescriptive solution, what my hope would be is that people would think holistically about the whole site, the whole system, and how they're designing nature to be integrated into their way of doing the development. You know, we're thinking about things like green roofs. You know, we know that we're gonna have larger floor plates, do we need to have conventional roofs? Can we have more green roofs? Do we want to look at rainwater harvest and reuse to help offset potable water? Maybe we want actually some blue roof systems. So again, it's more of a systems thinking about what the goal is. One of the things that's been really interesting about the work we're doing around the uh, Rain City strategy is starting to identify on a watershed basis for Vancouver, what are the different priorities in different areas? If you know that your development is in an area where we have a very significant green deficiency, where we have huge challenges potentially with urban heat, and we know that having uh, water available locally would be a high priority from a long-term water security perspective, the kind of strategies and design tools that you would want to take in those areas would be different than an area that maybe doesn't have an urban heat problem, maybe has a, actually a great wealth of ecological uh, systems in place and so other solutions might be more appropriate so I hope that when we get through this process what we can start to think about and communicate is what might different priorities look like in different communities from a watershed perspective and then of course for local communities different local communities are going to have their own um, needs and interests and so how do we reflect that as well so I would just say not a prescriptive solution but more performance based and show us your creativity of how you can try to meet the interests that we're describing. 
I'll also add that, I mean, in many cases, infiltration obviously is the primary focus of trying to, uh, to increase permeability. But in parks, for example, sometimes we're looking at water capture and reuse. So we're needing water for irrigation, or we're needing water for a wetland, or to sustain urban trees that aren't doing very well in these drought situations. So how could you use a hard surface, either a roof or a parking lot, to capture some of that water? And you obviously have to have a place to store it, but that's part of the equation as well. It sort of blends the kind of green infrastructure with, with uh, some of the water conservation as well as the ecological values we're trying to sustain. Yeah. I just want to add one more thing. Um, there's a really great video, you can check it out on YouTube. It's called The Berlin Sponge City. And we love that one. We just came across it about a month ago. I really captured what we're trying to do. But anyway, the, the urban hydrologist in the, the video says, you know, how do you find ways for even soil to hold that water so that it can then actually evaporate into the atmosphere? And he called it nature's air conditioning. And he talked about the, the community of Rummelsburg in Berlin that 20 years ago actually designed a community with no sewer system, no drainage system, right? The idea was actually providing soil volumes and areas where water can infiltrate, it can be held, can naturally evaporate into the atmosphere that it's not, you know, infiltration is one important, but actually evaporation or evapotranspiration to our plant systems is another really important mechanism. Part of that, again, that natural water cycle we're trying to restore. So just, you know, put that thought out there as well. Slide all over here. <laughs> I think what we've learned is that the best way to communicate is to have principles and to incentivize innovation around those principles and backstep the principles with perform measurable performance criteria. And um, I think I'm learning, I think I've learned today that you don't have quite the regulatory leverage or hammer the way we do in the US with the Clean Water Act and you know criteria that uh, developers have to, some simple criteria uh, that can be used to back, to, to back into the principles and to innovate. Uh, it's far too easily done for the design community to, you know, think that there's five ways to do something and they simply size those five ideas for every project when, in fact, there's an infinite number of ways to do things. And when you apply the principles instead of, you know, five formulas, when you apply the principles to a piece of property, you come up, if people are being humble, honest, open, and really applying principles, you come up with wonderful innovation yeah, that usually is far better than any formulaic approach and can get us in the US to equal or exceed the you know the regulatory hammers of drivers. Thanks. We were given notice that we're about halfway through about a minute or two or three ago. Hello Steve um, this question is directed mainly for myself. Um, we do have regulation here, particularly in terms of pollution of our streams and waters, as in the United States. But getting, getting back to the main themes, it would be fair to say, perhaps, that most of the people in the audience are disciples of what you're saying already. Our problem really here in Vancouver, which may exist elsewhere, is that we have a lot of silo-type regulation and silo departments. So whereas the park board may be concerned about the budget for, say, tennis courts or replacing the green turf for playing soccer, um, the, the road department may be concerned about, well, let's have uh, ornamental trees in the body bars instead of shade trees because they do a lot of damage to sidewalks and the roads and so all those kind of things. Even our planning, our area planning, our community plans, and I've participated in the last three, do not mention the watersheds. Watersheds is like, outside this room, ask 100 people who made that fire there, say, I understand what a watershed is, and if you look at the map that was presented this evening, all of our uh, political areas, there no resemblance whatsoever to the watersheds. So, getting more to the point now, um, it would seem to me that we need to raise the issue of water, water quality in particular, the integration of the ecosystems, and 
bring back the ecological services they provide, we can't put a value on them precisely at this point, to a point where politicians understand the need for the critical nature of preserving the ecological services and so on. How do we do that? So I thought that perhaps um, one way would be to make sure that it starts with the young kids in the schools. Unfortunately, our parks boards and our school boards and our engineering departments, perhaps, and I stand corrected on this, I don't get together and discuss how the kids can bring this or nurture through this process so that it becomes a critical item when they're of voting age. Our political system is such that I mentioned the word housing, affordability, and traffic. They're the three items. Watershed, no. So, is there anywhere in the United States where this is being brought to grassroots level through the schools and up to I, I think there's wonderful examples. Um, even in Canada, we worked on the High Park uh, restoration in Toronto, and I was, I was uh, in, initially amused at the way uh, school groups came out and were fascinated by the restoration of the savannas. And then I began to realize the importance of that conversation to the community. Um, it came to fruition because there was an inspired mayor, Mayor David Crombie, uh, and a planning, head of planning, uh, Ken Greenberg and others. Um, I think in the US, I think we've got wonderful examples where school children are brought in to add an exclamation point to something that's de-emphasized or not linked, not coupled with the real issues. And I think there's great examples of that, uh, but they're not necessarily operating at scale. You know, so the flooding in Houston, I, I, there's no uh, poster child or there's no conversation yet. I think what's going to have to happen and is about to happen is the economic alternatives are being looked at. Uh, and the, the mythology about the, you know, the fallacies of, of past design, past thinking, is going to be elevated to consciousness. There's a lot of people suffering, a lot of people that lost everything. So the conversation is going to change, is changing very quickly. I think every day there's editorials in the newspaper. I think it'd be great if they're written by children that simplified everything, but that's not happening to my knowledge. Um, I actually think there's bottom up, top down, uh, meet somewhere in the middle, and the middle is moving uh, ways that have to be brought to bear to make this conversation really effective. Um, we try doing it with a little bit of science that goes over a lot of people's heads. Uh, what works best, in my experience, is kicking the tires, taking people out to solutions that have worked and letting people. In a, in a group, uh, hear about how, why the solutions have worked, taking people to places where, this, where failed solutions uh, haven't worked, and letting people understand why they haven't worked. This is about a kind of a reality check that has to do a 360, a full circle around the issue. And, you know, children are a part of that conversation. I mean, I think there are exceptions to that generalization that schools are not sort of involved in some of these things. Go out to Jericho Park and most weekdays you'll see them using it as a cross-country race course, which is great, but there's preschools that are using it for outdoor education and things like that. So we're, we have a, the park board now has an environmental stewardship coordinator that's trying to partner schools with parks. Uh, Oak Meadows Park near Van Dusen, partners were there at Canberra, for example, and they do a lot of pollinator removal work. So these still might be exceptions, but I think that's changing. And part of it has been um, limited by the resources available to schools. I, mean, I think we look at school grounds as almost as much green space across the city as, as parks, in, at least in some neighborhoods, but they haven't had an opportunity to plant trees or diversify some of They're just mowed from corner to corner to corner because of the lack of those resources. So I think, you know, I'm not saying we can change that, and that's an easy thing to change, but I think we, we acknowledge that there is opportunity, opportunity there. Question over here. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, like, we've talked about uh, watersheds and making things more accessible to the public. Um, like, with, like, Vancouver's developing very, very fast right now. 
and so and it's very it's a very complicated process a lot of the time, and so people are always looking for sh shorthands to uh, manage that. So like you know, like so one of the things that stuck out to me was uh, the importance of elevation within the watershed. Would that be an effective tool for people just to have an entry point to the discussion, or would, would there, or would there be another one you would suggest? Quite sure I understand what you mean by elevation. Maybe you could just expand on that. So d distance from the tributaries. So if, if you're just in the trickle zone or stream zone, river, okay. so, uh, coastal. Okay, with Vancouver, as you saw from the map, we don't actually have a lot of natural streams anymore. We've only got a few really that are at the surface. So most of our streams are buried. But what I will tell you from our drainage sheds, which is our man-made sort of modern incarnation of what used to be a stream system, is it really matters what happens in different parts of the watershed. So the more upstream in the watershed that you can actually take water out of that system and allow it to infiltrate or, or evaporate or evapotranspirate, the better the effect is going to be on kilometers and kilometers of pipe network down the road or down in the system. So absolutely targeting upfront in the watershed matters. Like I bet most people don't realize that when you flush a toilet on a really rainy day at 39th and Canby, you are likely contributing to a combined sewer overflow in False Creek. Most people probably don't make that connection because they're not thinking about that system's perspective and they're not thinking about how everything's connected. So 100%, we need to take action everywhere. We need to take action at a small scale throughout the city that collectively will have a big impact. But I definitely think there's great potential to be strategic about targeting certain parts of our our uh, watershed areas in a priority way to try to have a greater um, benefit and impact downstream the whole way. So we've got time for two more questions. I'm interested in um, the band play concept and planning of the park and your experience in the commercialization of parks um, for parks and recreation and competing priorities, trying to build budgets, and, and have you had experience with both that and competing, competing uh, parties and priorities? Um, let, let me think about that. I'll come back. It's more the focus on commercialization, because yeah. that's a real threat. I'm, I'm not actually with the park board, but I don't know that I can speak to commercialization. The only thing I will say is I think with the creativity we have in Vancouver, there is a tremendous opportunity to try to leverage multiple benefits for a single investment. And I think from a culture change standpoint, that's something that we really aspire to, is to think differently about how we can make one intervention, one investment, one approach that actually can have many different benefits for many different interests. Raindrops to, to fall upon the earth, to uh, do something on their property and to benefit financially from what they offer uh, in some sort of measurable way. You know, if you're, if you're measuring or if you're uh, managing every raindrop, giving every raindrop a soft landing, <coughs> coddling every raindrop with love and showing it into the ground. You've committed something on your land to be able to do that. You think that would be valuable if everybody did that uh, and the scale of everybody was large enough. You know, the, the operation and maintenance cost and the replacement cost for all the infrastructure of the city that all you are going to pay for with your tax money. Uh, should be greatly reduced. So I would I would think there'd be a, an incentive and a commercial value in figuring out how to incentivize that sort of behavior. And I don't think that's exactly what you were asking about, but hopefully that's helpful. Your turn. Well, I think we'll go on to the last question rather than go on that. One more. Um, so I think. Uh, one of the issues, especially in a city like Vancouver, we don't have a lot of large, new, like, natural areas that we'd be able to reinstitute, especially given the land values and that, but 
think there's a lot of smaller scale interventions that can happen throughout the city. And I think one of the real challenges that I see where these often fail is we're great at building them, but really bad at maintaining them. And do you have any good examples of um, cities that have maybe had a really, um, are, are a good model for stewardship of these spaces and maintenance? So the best uh, examples I've seen are the Leopoldian motivated examples where you, know, you, you really uh, make uh, these projects participatory and engage and empower the community in a variety of ways. And you know, most, most agency budgets aren't good at doing owning. They're good at protecting, buying land, doing the, they're good sometimes, depends upon what the budget's like. And what, the costs are, but uh, we we the best examples of O and M I've seen are where we add a real estate transaction surcharge to the every transaction a piece of property goes through, and what we've done in the states on probably uh, forty or fifty projects, maybe a hundred by now, is we've added one half of one percent of the original transaction value and all subsequent transactions on the property in perpetuity to create an environmental endowment. And that endowment is being used to finance the operation and maintenance and stewardship and public education and funding scholarships and watersheds. So I think, I think creativity around funding, and I'm not talking about a developer impact fee, which, which is paid once and usually paid to reimburse sewer costs and other you know, utility costs. I'm talking about something on top of the real estate transaction value that's transacted that kicks into an environmental endowment account that's privately managed, not publicly managed. So it's managed to generate a return and you know 80% of that return or 50% of that return is reinvested annually and the interest off that money is used to finance stewardship. So assurance around funding and a program, once the, the funding is in place, we've generally seen good people are hired and programs have continuity and have coherency. And that, that and participatory conservation are the best projects. I just share an example of uh, Prince George County in the US that they did what's called a community-based, I think it's a community-based P3. So public-private partnership, but rather than having sort of a for-profit for model, the model was actually about community stewardship, community empowerment. So they actually developed very extensive green infrastructure, um, insulation programs covering you know hundreds of acres. And the idea was that they did it on a 30-year contract with community organizations. And the way they were able to rationalize it to their city council to support it was not about um, good stewardship of the watershed and all this. It was actually all about economic development for communities that would benefit from increased um, capacity building, education, support in learning how to run and operate a small business. They looked at, um, I think they had different targets around um, different sort of minor minority groups and different groups that they perceived to need additional support getting into the economic uh, workplace, they had you know training programs about how do you manage a small employees, how do you do your books, how do you develop business. So it was a huge economic development program, and what's very interesting is actually that model is delivering very affordable green infrastructure investments. And so the people are responsible for not only doing the capital investment, but actually doing the O and M on those investments over 30 years. I'll tell you that in Vancouver, and I see one of our my colleagues from the city of Vancouver who's really actively involved in thinking about operations and maintenance, we're keenly aware of this issue and we're really trying to foster a change in mindset about the role of plants and ecosystems and the health of those soil ecosystems as a fundamental part of how we manage water in the city. And it's not something where we could just say, well, we're just going to neglect it and um, you know, let the boulevards go hairy. Maybe we should let the boulevards go hairy because they're enhancing our, our uh, interception of rain and, and whatnot. But 
we're just trying to really sort of articulate a different way of thinking about our urban fabric and that these natural assets in our cities play a fundamental role to the quality of our city and in fact the performance. And so we need to care for them as though they're performing that wonderful service for our community. Thanks very much, that's a great way to end. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to thank both our speakers, Melina and Steve, it was been a great evening. So. So just in closing, a, a reminder that Creative Mornings has been filming tonight's session and the video will be published on the Urban Area website shortly. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the presence of one of our parkour commissioners, Catherine Evans, in the, in the crowd tonight. So that's nice to see. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> our next talk will be November 15th on the theme of celebration and diversity and features Kamala Todd as an inspiring Indigenous filmmaker and town planner, and Frida and Frank with their very playful approach to engaging people in public space. So hope to see you on the, the 15th. And if anyone wants to continue this conversation, you can join us at the lobby of the Hotel Georgia um, for a drink or more, more conversation. So again, thank you all for coming, and hopefully you learned something and enjoyed the evening.